Um, all right, so good evening. Welcome to session number six for uh, TH615, Biblical Theology. And so I just want to read one passage of scripture that I hope will be an encouragement to you tonight. And the word of the Lord says, this is coming from Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 until verses 24. 16 until verses 24. The word of the Lord says, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from the doing the things that you want to do. If you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warned you as I warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And so I just really want to challenge each one of you tonight. We're all leaders. We're all serving. And I really want to encourage you that sometimes our ministry and especially our behavior resembles more the works of the flesh than the fruit of the spirit. And so, you know, the connection maybe with our biblical theology theme is this idea of fruit, the, 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 the fruit, the fruit of the spirit. There's a connection there in, in the, in the biblical theological framework, but I do really want to encourage everyone tonight that I want you to, to think about in your ministry, is your ministry characterized by you personally? Is it characterized by love, joy, peace? Are you a patient person? Is there kindness? Do people consider you kind? Goodness, faithfulness, and, and the faithfulness is to God, not, not to the ministry. Gentleness and self-control. And so you know, notice how there isn't a big church there. There's not a lot of converts. Not to say that that isn't an outworking from this, but this is more fundamental. And so oftentimes we have the characteristics of a lot of disciples and amazing preaching, amazing teaching. But here, the, the key characteristics that, that uh, reveal us to be in Christ, to be crucified with Christ, are these. And these are all internal and these are all in our heart. And so I just, I really want you, each one of us to be self-aware and to be reflecting upon if these things are true in our lives, in our ministry lives. And if, and if they are not, it doesn't matter how big your ministry is. It doesn't matter how great you think you are for, for, for Christ. The reality is, is that, is that you're nothing. And that without these, uh, you will never have tr true success. You want to have, you will never have uh, a truly blessed ministry. So with that, let's go ahead and let's open in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, and we thank you that you chose to wrote it, write it down, that you have given it to us, and we want to lift up your name. We want to lift up your word. We want to exalt it tonight as we study it. Father, I ask for understanding for the students that they would grasp the concepts that we're teaching, the foundation, that they would see the biblical theological framework. And it's so important. It's such an important foundation, Father God. I just, I pray that you would um, reveal this to the students and give them strength as they, they struggle through the text. I, I know it's hard, it's difficult, it's challenging, but I pray that this would be the case, Father. Father, I ask now for um, you to be lifted up and exalted. May we see a new vision of you. and May you lead us by your spirit. And lastly, we just ask that your spirit would evidence these fruits in our lives and that we would focus on these fruits above all else. In Jesus' name, our Lord and Savior, we pray all these things by faith. Amen. If everyone can just make sure their mics are muted. And uh, let me go ahead and share the PowerPoint for us tonight. 
And um, actually, no, I'm sorry. Um, what we're going to do first. Yes, that is correct. We're, we're going to finish. So, so let's do the PowerPoint. And then, so my goal for tonight is going to be, we're going to finish the PowerPoint from last week. And then we're going to have a breakout session to discuss the new content. Then we're going to do the notes. And then we're going to have a, a final breakout session. So I hope that we'll be able to do all of these things. We do need to finish from last week. And, um, and then we'll have the new content. So no doubt you, you finished your reading for tonight. And uh, hopefully we will also have that by God's grace, we will. So just really quick, quickly moving along here. I just want to, we're finishing session number five, the mode and content for special revelation. And so last week we had the breakout session that you, you were able to discuss. You also, we also are in the middle of these notes. So we're finishing these notes and in between the notes, we've been doing the, the, the scriptural basis and overview. So that's really been what we have been doing. And so uh, let's just, I'm going to review the PowerPoint, but we'll, we'll move on to the, to the new content. And uh, as I've mentioned before, just if you have a question, don't hesitate to, to stop me to ask the question. And so um, with that, let's begin. So we had the breakout room already. So the, the mode and content of pre-redemptive special revelation. So we talked about how the, um, we're now into the history of Revelation. This should be a, a Roman numeral number three, not, not number two. And uh, um, within Roman numeral number three, we're dealing with the mode and content of special revelation in the Old Testament. So if you can imagine the big framework, we looked at the Old Testament as anticipatory, as promise, the New Testament as fulfillment, the Old Testament as shadow type, the New Testament as... as um, uh, substance reality. Okay. So, um, and then the third image of course was the seed and then the flower. Okay. So those are, those are different. Those are different images that we shouldn't, we shouldn't emphasize one. We should really have a, a multifaceted perspective of revelation. So right now we're in the seed. We're in the, the shadow, the type. We are in the, the promise portion of the history of revelation. So that's big letter A. And number one, so number one within that, we're looking at the mode and content of pre-redemptive special revelation. So this is really the big perspective here. And so we talked about overview and just and, and mode. And so just a couple of things with the with the overview and mode. I'll just reread these. I, I won't really explain them. I explained them last week. And so we just had a clarification that as you, you as we as we read Voss, as we look, even not just Voss, but other um, theologians in the earlier 20th century, the 19th, 18th, 17th century and earlier, the, the, the word religion is really used in a positive uh, context. It's not in this negative state. It doesn't have this negative stigma that it does now. That's not to say that religion hasn't been abused, that there hasn't been a false religion, but the use of the word has, has been used. It's really kind of gone to the next level that if you use the word religion, you're, you're really... Um, that's a bad word. And so that's not really the case. Even in scripture, the word is used very positively by James. And so I do think it's a misunderstood and, and it's true with all words in, in Christianity. They're all, they have all been abused. So uh, we need to reclaim them and we need to, 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 give, to, to maintain uh, a, a biblical definition and share those uh, biblical definitions with those around us. Um, the next thing that we also talked about was that um, was that the, uh, the, the, the pre-fall disclosure, so pre-fall includes, includes Genesis 1 and 2, is very primitive and it's largely symbolic. And so we looked at, we looked throughout scripture how those, those tokens, those physical symbols in the garden are transformed. They're brought into their full substance. If you can think about type and substance, we see that they're they're representing something so much greater, and so um, those those tokens um, are a means of instruction. They're a means of of instruction, and they're sacramental or they're pre prefigurations. And so, sacramental is this idea of a of an outward sign to a greater reality. Okay, um, and so we saw that we saw that I hope we saw that very powerfully last week. And so um, 
those uh, um, the, 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 the symbolism, though Voss is very clear, so I'm quoting him, the symbolism does not deny the, um, the historical reality. The historical reality is just as important as, as what it's signifying, okay? So if there is no historical reality in the symbol, that's the foundation. If it doesn't exist, how do we have assurance of, of what it points to, okay? And so especially in, in a lot of, a lot of uh, scholarship today, you're seeing it more and more in the Philippines, around the world, that liberalism from academia in Europe, in America is coming, is coming to Asia, it's coming to Africa, it's coming to South America, it's coming here. And so they will deny the historicity of many of these fundamental things. Genesis is fundamental to the rest of scripture. They will deny those realities. And so Voss is really pushing back against that. And so as you read Voss, we have to read them in this understanding. Uh, next, we just talked about how the mode was direct speech. You have this direct speech from God to man. Um, and, and we see that, that um, God's word, the, 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 the power of God's word is revealed in creation. Okay. And so that is, that is an incredible significance concerning the power and the presence of God and his word. And so uh, with that, there's many different with that, there's many different kinds of, of, of the content. There's a lot of different content that God reveals to man. It includes blessing. He gives a blessing. There's a commissioning. There's commands. There's prohibition. There's promises. And there's, and there's a warning. So there's really, in this, in this pre-redemptive special revelation, it's, it's everything. It's every type of, for the most part, every type of speech. Um, um, is there in seed form. And so um, now for sure, these things are really unpacked, bigger things are presented, but it, it's there in fundamental form, okay? Uh, next, so the, there's four principles, and these principles are really important um, that, that Voss is going to, to share with us. And so he does clarify, it's not allegorical, it's, it's, it's typological, as we already shared. And so um, I won't, I'll just refer you to our discussion last week concerning that. And, and some people won't accept that, you know, fair enough for, for, for this class, especially with Voss as our guide. I think that's very fair, not only with scripture, but also with what he's saying. So, so I don't think it, it's fair at all to, to, to um, um, at, at a surface reading, you would, you, you could, you could maybe accuse him of being allegorical. But by his own words, he, he does not view himself, nor is he trying to do allegorical. Now, perhaps you could say he's inconsistent. Fair enough. But, but we need to be fair with him. And, and, and we do see types in Scripture, the Lamb of God, um, the serpent being raised up, the temple, um, the priesthood. There are a lot of different types that, that we have to concede, that we have to concede here. Um, moving along here. Um, and so uh, the, 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 the Voss's basis for his interpretation is the, the, the reoccurrence of these symbols in a transformed higher reality, a, a pure reality in the, the end of the Bible. And, and you really can't, you really can't, I mean, it's beyond uh, coincidence that the last two chapters return to the garden but it's been transformed. It's, it's at a higher state of blessedness. It's at this just, just transforming, um, transcending all, all kinds of expectation. And, and it comes right back there. So, so I do think that this is very a very fair reading of scripture. And we need to be considering these four principles throughout scripture. And I think the more we read scripture, the more we really see these four principles throughout scripture. Um, whether in, temp in, in our temporal life now or in the eternal life to come, okay? And so the four, the four principles are this, the principle of life. And so you see the principle of life uh, that, that occurs in, in Noah's day. It's in Abraham's, it's in the patriarchs. It's offered and promised in, in, to Israel in the Mosaic covenant, right? 
Um, you can choose life or death, right? Blessing or cursing. So th this principle of life occurs throughout scripture. It's in the Psalms. It's in Proverbs. The tree of life is throughout Proverbs. It's in the prophets. It's in the New Testament. Uh, transformed or brought into true reality, what, what the type is signifying, that is eternal life. That is life without end in, 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 in the new creation. So we talked about that and we really concluded that last week. So um, that was from last week. Uh, we're going to discuss tonight the principle of probation. So the principle of probation is very important. The principle of testing and temptation and sin. And so this occurs throughout redemptive history. Th that This cannot be overlooked. So many different individuals go through this, this, these principle of probation, testing, temptation, and also sin. Israel does it. The kings do it. The prophets. Uh, everyone, this principle is, is throughout all of scripture. So it's, again, and it's fundamental because it begins in the garden. So it's, it, it, it's, it's at the beginning, throughout, and then at the end. And then, of course, the principle of death. Again, this theme. So what I, I also want to challenge you is that this could be something extra in your own personal study time. You could take these four themes here. There's other themes. There's idea of kingdom, covenant. But these four themes, life, probation, testing, or temptation, and sin, and then death. And you could trace these through every single book of the Bible, and, and you would be able to see this, the, these themes present. And they would not be in the back. They would be in the foreground of the book. And so that, that's yet another proof to show the power, the power of this, these principles. So we talked about the tree of life. And so the tree of life stands in the midst of the garden. The garden is the garden of God. And so Voss brings out the emphasis that it's not man's garden, it's God's place. And it's specifically the place of reception of man into fellowship with God. But it's God's dwelling place and he permits man to be there. And it, that's where he meets and communes with man. And so we're going to see this um, throughout scripture that um, man falls into sin and there's a separation. He's kicked out of the garden, but then God is slowly making steps to bring back God, uh, um, God and man back into this, this permanent state of fellowship and blessedness. Okay. And so, so, and, and it's through this plan of redemption. Okay. So think of Redemption is bringing man back into this place, into the dwelling place of God. And revelation is him revealing how he's going to do it and how he does it. <laughs> okay, so yeah, that, that is a fundamental uh, component. We looked at scripture references. We looked at Genesis 3.22, Ezekiel 28. Uh, <laughs> obviously, there's debate there. I think we'll talk about Ezekiel, Ezekiel 28 again, because it is it is quite important looking at looking at Satan and, um, and uh, the reality of Satan in the garden. And then uh, we'll also be looking at Proverbs. Pro Proverbs was highlighting this idea of the tree of life throughout wisdom literature, that the tree of life is present there. Um, and then, of course, in, in its fullness, in this eternal life type context. It's, there's, there's many more examples that we could go to. We could go to John. We can go to... To the, to the Gospel of John, we can go to throughout um, Paul. There's just so many references to, to this idea, this concept of eternal life. But but these are just the passages in many ways, I think Voss is, is in some ways guiding us. And, and we're really going to the, to the apocalypse of Jesus Christ to find that final um, resolution or truth. Uh, next, we have... Um, uh, so the conclusion here is this. This is a big takeaway. I would really highly recommend that you write this down. I'll leave it on the I'll leave it on the screen for a little bit. Very profound statement. The tree of life was associated with the higher, the unchangeable, the eternal life to be secured through the probation, anticipating, uh, anticipating the result 
by a present enjoyment of the fruit would have been out of keeping with its sacramental character. And so what Voss is saying is the, the whole, everything going on in the garden was anticipatory of, of the greater reality. The, the tree of life in the garden was sacramental. It was a token. It was, a, it was just a physical picture of a greater reality to which all of mankind was going to. And so we talked about as well how man fell, but that was part of God's plan. And, and it wasn't like, okay, man messed this up. Let's go to plan B. No, that, that was part of the design. Not that, not that man is, not, not that God um, wanted man to sin, but, then, but that is the reality of, of the, the, the condition of both man and even angelic beings. And we can talk about philosophically why that is, but, um, and there's different ways of answering that. But nonetheless, when God created creation, um, um, he, he, he knew this was going to happen, and this was on the way to, to something much greater, okay? Um, but in no way, in no way does, is he responsible for the man of sin. Um, uh, for, he is responsible for man's sin. Man, man is completely to blame. Satan is completely responsible for it. But God allowed it to happen to bring about a greater purpose, okay? So we can use the example of um, Joseph, I always go back there. Literally, Joseph's brothers planned Joseph planned their sin against Joseph. They planned it for evil. God planned it for good. So there is a great divine mystery there that God uses even the sin of man to bring about his greater purpose. Yet, he's not the one responsible. He's not the one that commits it. Um, he, he, he allows it to happen, but, but for a greater purpose. And, and in allowing it to happen, that's part of his plan. So uh, maybe a useful example of this, and this is, of course, deficient because we are, it's a finite example. But in my house, you know, I, I, am, I am in control of our house. Now, I can, I can let, I can prevent my daughter from ever touching the stove, right? I can always prevent her from touching the stove. But perhaps one time, I would allow her to touch the stove so that she would know that she shouldn't touch it because she'd burn herself. Okay. Now I am not responsible if she touches the stove, especially if I've warned her, if I say, Carmichael, don't touch the stove. And then she goes over and touches the stove, but I allow her to do that. You know, that's on her, <laughs> that's on her. Right. But I've allowed her to experience that pain for, for a moment so that she knows that she can't touch hot surfaces. She has to be careful. Okay. So that's a very weak and deficient example, but, but that, but that's, that, that's an example of how, I am completely sovereign in my house. I'm in control of my house, but yet I'll allow my daughter to, to maybe do something of her own will. It's, it's her will, not mine, but to teach her a lesson, okay? Or, or to bring about something better for her, okay? So that, that, that's one analogy deficient as it may be. Is, is, is everyone tracking with that? Is, are there any questions at this point or is that making sense? Makes a lot of sense. Okay, okay, good. Let, let, let's go on. I, I, I don't see any hands. So, so let's continue here. Is that Glenn? Was that Glenn? Yes, yes, that was me. Just, uh, oh, good to I'm, see you. I'm on the road. Yeah, I'm on the oh, road. Okay. I'm, yeah, driving. Cool, cool. Well, I'm, glad, I'm glad you're tuning in and you have good reception. Uh, okay, let's go on. Let's go on. We're, we're, we're burning <laughs> our session, so we got to go. Um, Next, we talked about the river of life. And so in the river of life, this is also the river of life in the garden is symbolic. Um, the symbolism of the paradise of God, um, God's center implication appears in still another form in the prophets and the Psalter. And so we looked at how th this, this, this river of life continues to come back throughout scripture and climaxes again in Revelation 21 and 22 as the throne of God who's dwelling among men. And there's a river flowing out of the throne. And so, uh, and so, again, it's, it's not coincidence that there's a river that, that not only waters Eden, but waters the whole earth in Genesis 1 and 2. And that river, the river of life, continues to crop up throughout redemptive history and climaxes in Revelation 22. The prophets predict that in the future age, waters will flow from the near dwelling place of Jehovah. 
even as the tree stood in the midst of the garden, still in the apocalypse we read of the streams of water proceeding from the throne of God, the new Jerusalem, with trees and life on either side. It will be observed that here, two symbolisms of tree of life and waters are interwoven. So we really see this interwoving, uh, interweaving, I should say, interweaving of, of images. We gave scriptural references here. You can write them down. You can also refer to the to, to the session from from last um, from last week to, to to look at those. We didn't look at every single one. But we looked at many of these. I'll just leave that up for a minute if someone wants to write it down. Okay, new content. So now we're on to the principle of probation. So if you had questions on this, this could be a time for us to discuss. Um, and so there were three there were three views of uh, of probation that that Voss discusses. And so um, the first view is the mythical interpretation. The second view is the independent autonomous choice interpretation. And then the third is Voss's preferred uh, choice. And that is that it's God's appointed instrument to lead man through probation into a state of religious and moral purity with the highest blessedness and eternal life. Okay. So that's that's Voss's view. The mythical interpretation, if, if we're conservative Christians, we should just immediately reject it because the whole claim is that it's just pagan mythology. The gods don't want man to get knowledge and man wants to get knowledge. And so there's a warning of don't touch the tree of knowledge and you know, blah, blah. We're not going to talk all about that. Um, needless to say, um, that, that that's incorrect. Okay. Um, I, I, do, I do want to say that um, sometimes Voss presents several, several different views and, and two of the views are not antithetical or an either or type category. So, 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 so sometimes in, in interpretation and in the interpretative method, uh, it's not always an either or, you know, sometimes it is, sometimes it's not. Okay, so um, in this instance, I, I'm gonna say, it's not an either or, and my I actually view strongly that it's a it's a both and. The second and third view are preferable. Okay, and so um, now now why is that the case? Why is that the case? So I have a couple of reasons why it's the case, and maybe we can have we can have a discussion here or or some pushback. Um, uh, number one, God. It's shown in chapter one that God is the the determiner and assessor of what is good. Okay. This is accented in chapter one. Every time you make something, it's good, okay? And so there is, there, is a, there is a clear dependence idea of man not determining what's good for himself, but depending on, upon God and God's word to define what is good, okay? So that's the first thing I want to say. So, so, to, to, so to disregard option number two, you know, in some ways that kind of goes against this idea here because the whole point of, of selecting a tree that 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 would contain however you want to see it this idea of knowledge of good and evil um uh it, it kind of goes against this idea that god is god knows what's good and he's calling man to follow him and to obey him and and then man has this choice to wh however else the tree is viewed and this is kind of more in the line of of, of Voss, that however you define knowledge of good and evil um man is choosing something else instead of God to determine what is good and evil. Okay. So, so, so point number one to me, I just, the context strongly suggests that at least there is this aspect of dependence upon God and, and it leans towards the, the, the second view option. Okay. Um, part number two, part of the temptation, part of the temptation was to become like God knowing good and evil. Okay. So, so that kind of leads that kind of leads out of number one. God was the assessor of good and evil, and then in the temptation, it was to be like God, right? It's it's the the the, the serpent's very specific. You will be like God, knowing good and evil. Okay, so that's kind of the that's kind of the the the, the draw, if you will. So again, that that seems to again lean towards option number two. Um, uh, number three. The woman sees the opportunity, the opportunity to get wisdom apart from God. So, and this actually comes into our discussion, looking at Ezekiel 28, which we'll come back to, is that man does not have wisdom. 
<laughs> okay? So, so thinking about Ezekiel 28, uh, man and women, uh, man and woman in the garden don't yet have wisdom. They're depending upon God for their wisdom. And, and so choosing the tree of knowledge and good of evil is an opportunity and an opportunity for them to seek wisdom apart from God. And that's clear in Genesis chapter three. Okay, they're trying to become like God. They're trying to gain wisdom apart from God. Okay, um, and then, you know, at the end of the day, we should always make our decisions on what the context says. You know, I never make, and I, it's a very bad practice to have. I never make my exegetical decision by, oh, John MacArthur has this position. John Piper has that position. I'm going to follow their lead, okay? Um, now, I can follow their lead in the sense that's a good point. Let me, let me take it and use it for myself, and then I give them credit. But at the end of the day, um, you can never say to God, oh, well, that was John Piper's view, so I followed him. No, at the end of the day, it's our job to, to interpret the word of God and to come up with a decision. And um, following a path of, of, of that type is, is really bad because we're no longer looking what the text says. We're looking at what a man says, okay? So I hope that in, in looking at, at these reasons, we can see how we should be looking at what other men say, how they interpret. But at the end of the day, we don't depend upon them. Is, 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 everyone, tracking, is everyone tracking there? And so I, I am going to quote from the Reformation Study Bible, R.C. Sproul, because I, I think it, it's a great statement. And, and in some ways also it's, it's you know, Voss is, Voss is a high, you know, he's a high standard. So if I'm disagreeing with Voss, there should be, there should be some, 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 at least precedent of other people disagreeing with him, you know, because you don't want to be on, on, on a limb by yourself. Okay. Um, but, but, but for me, at the end of the day, it really is, you know, the, the, the word of God. Um, but this would be something where we, where I say something you like, something you dislike. This could be something for me that I think was a weakness in Voss. But, but look at this quotation from the Reformation Study Bible, uh, edited by Sproul. I don't know, if, I don't think Sproul did Genesis, but he's the, the, the primary editor, the general editor. The illicit taking of fruit involves the assertion of human autonomy. So that's number two, Diva, autonomy. The attempt to govern uh, apart from God. Man must live by faith in God's word and not by a professed self-sufficiency of moral judgment. The law makes wise the simple. And so Psalm 19 says, um, how do we become wise? Not by going our own way, but by depending upon the law, which is the word of God. Okay. And so um, I think that this is a, 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 an amazing quotation. And I think it further strengthens our exegetical decision that self-autonomy is present. Is everyone tracking there with me? So what I want to say in, um, in conclusion is that I think it's two and three, okay? I think, I, I don't think you, it, it, it's not, it's not an either or. I think that, I think that there is self-autonomy being the temptation of self-autonomy, the, the temptation to gain wisdom apart from God. And I think it's the mechanism by which God tested man. <laughs> so it's both. God can use that. There has to be a temptation to, to, to call someone. Let me take a step back. Not temptation. I'm using the wrong word. Testing. Satan used it as a temptation. God used it as a test. God used it as probation. So I want, I want to take a step back. If I used the word temptation, it was not temptation from God's perspective. It's a test from God's perspective uh, uh, to see what's in man's heart. Satan is using it as temptation. Okay, so I, I apologize from earlier if I was using, I, I should not be using those willy-nilly. Um, so um, uh, it's a test from God, and, and it, there has to be a temptation involved from Satan for it to be, for it to be real. And so I think, um, I think we can have options two, two and three, and that's actually my position. So I want to say, yes, boss, you're correct, but mostly correct. I want to, I want to tweak it a little bit. Okay. So that would be a, a correction or a tweak in my reading. Did other people wrestle with that? What, what's your pushback? Maybe you disagree with me and say, Tim, you're out of line. You're questioning boss. What, what are your thoughts? Let's just take a minute to, to ask thoughts. What are your thoughts on that? Okay. I don't, I don't hear anything. So I, I hope that's making sense. So 
in the principal probation, it's both, it's both, let's just go back here to the to the previous slide. It's it's a it's the offering of independent autonomous choice. And in that choice, that's the appointed instrument by God to lead man through pro probation to the highest state of religious moral purity with the highest blessedness of an eternal life. Okay, is everyone tracking there with me? So, so we can combine the two. You know, sometimes you can't. I really think you can. And, and, I, and I think both are, are true. You know, I, I really believe that with all my heart. You know, it, it is my interpretation, but I think I think the context supports both. And, and, and in each case, what we're going to go to in a minute is that God, God gives probation to many different people, okay, in redemptive history. And at the end of the day, each of those different, each one has a different test, okay? Each one has a different test. You'll see this, but it's God's ordained, appointed instrument to bring them through to to um, um, <laughs> to a religious state and and moral maturity with the highest blessedness eternal life. Okay. Pastor Tim, I have a question. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, is choice here in number two referring to free will? Yeah. So 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 in this case, man and. A woman, they had the complete free will and the ability. So their their nature was not fallen. Um, and in previous classes, in last semester, we talked about how we want to describe it. And I would want to describe it as untested, unproven. But they have they they are not yet internally. They don't have the damage of the effects of the fall in in, in the will. So they have they have human free will. In, in, in a in a true in in a, in a very re real sense, and it's not corrupted. It's not corrupted yet. Okay, great question. Okay, I, I don't see any other questions. Let's let's move on here. So let's move on to uh, scriptural evidence for this. Okay, so we're not going to go to these because we don't have the time. But just like Adam, Noah, Abraham. Israel, David, and Jesus all go through a period of probation to secure their covenants with God. Okay, everyone tracking there with me? Every single one of them went through their probation period. So let's just talk here for a minute. What was Noah's probation period? What was the test of Noah? Building the ark. Yes. Building the ark. Great job, Kaya. Building the ark and following God's instructions. Very specific. And so he, he, he was faithful in the, in, the, uh, in the probation, and that led to the Noahic covenant, the confirmation of the Noahic covenant. Excellent. Um, what about Abraham? What is Abraham's test? Someone other than Kaya, not Kaya's answer. Someone else. What is Abraham's test? Offering over his time. Okay, so yeah, so there's there's the test of, of sacrificing the son. That's one. And what else is what 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 would be the the bigger test that really ha has the the first promise given? Go to or, a place. Go to a place. Yeah, go go to a foreign land, right? Genesis twelve one to three. Go to a, a foreign land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation, and, and a great name, right? And so so I, I, Isaac is also a test. And his faith is also confirmed in, in, in Isaac, but but the but the first test in confirmation is in going to a foreign land. So so both of you are correct. Um, maybe the, the the maybe Genesis twelve is more fundamental because once he secured that, the the the, the children were already were already guaranteed once he ob obeyed that. Okay, good. Uh, what about Israel? What's Israel's test? What is Israel's test? Okay, so uh, two people. Uh, Jomar, go first, and then I think Sunny, Sunny, your second. Go ahead, Jomar. Uh, yeah, uh, obeying the the law, the yeah. law of uh, Moses. Okay, so law obeying God the through yeah. Moses. Yeah, so obeying the law. Um, can we tweak that a bit so that that that's a big comprehensive um, um, picture? Um, uh, anyone want to add to that? 
Sunny? <laughs> uh, obeying Mosaic law, the same thing. Yeah, okay. So, 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 yeah, the same thing. Obeying the law. And, and, and that's a good, that's a good, that's a good um, uh, answer. I also want us to be thinking about that. There was this probation period um, um, in, in Exodus through Deuteronomy, Diba. And so, and so throughout there, there's, there's a test. So we, we, in one sense, absolutely, we, we, you know, absolutely obeying the Mosaic law, but there's also a more generic and it's not too different, but it's, are, are they going to depend upon the word of God? So, so in Deuteronomy 8, God wants to see what's in their heart. He wants to see and teach them that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And so for Israel, that is the Mosaic law. Okay. So you are correct. Both of you are correct. At the same time, I'm, I'm, ma I'm making the connection back to Genesis, back to Noah, back to Abraham, and also to, into our context. It's also more general, this call to obey the word of God. Okay. Um, what about David? What was David's test? Is he not referred to as a, a man after God's own heart? And um, what is the difference between Saul and David? Because they both sinned. Is there a difference? What is the difference? Saul had a probation. He failed. He was out. What's the difference there with, with David? David repented. Repented. Yeah, both uh, Danny and and Jesus answered. That is correct. Uh, David and had Jesus. Go, yeah, go, go yeah. ahead. Go ahead. Paul did not repent. That instead yeah. he trusted the 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 wisdom of um of other people instead of yeah. God. Yeah, and, and he made a lot of excuses. His, his, his it was as if he did not in his mind he did not sin. It was someone else's sin. He was he was forced. He was forced to, to sin, and so um, yeah. So if we want to look at the the at David, it, he, generally speaking, he was a man that in his heart he 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 pursued God with his whole being. It didn't mean that he was perfect, and when he sinned, he repented. And so we could say that those um, it's this com complete commitment to the to to his relationship with God that really secures him. Um, this Davidic covenant, right? Um, uh, Jesus, wh when is Jesus's probation period? He was tempted. Yeah, when he was tempted in the wilderness, right? He was tempted in yeah, the Mark, wilderness. Mark 4, yeah. 11, 1 to 11. Yeah. Now that's really good. So in, in uh, um, yeah, in, I, think it's, I think it's Matthew. Matthew 4, 1 to 11. Um, uh, it's very clear. He goes in the wilderness just like Israel. He's tempted by Satan, but he he comes he 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 is faithful in the test, and and that's 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 a core example. But really, we could also talk about the, his his probation, even including up until the, the death on the cross, right? So that's the climax. That's the climax. The death on the cross, and then he is vindicated. That, his, that he has met the test and his sacrifice. And so um, we could also include that as well. Um, and, and so what we wanna see here is that this concept of probation continues to come back and, back, back, back and again and again. And the, these types are pointing to Christ, the perfect man, the prophet, priest, and king who secures for us the new covenant and in that new covenant, redemption is secure. Is everyone, does everyone, is everyone tracking there with, with, with me on that? So, so in Christ, these other, these other covenants are, are fulfilled and, and they point to the new covenant. And the new covenant is not, is not just applied in the New Testament to the church, okay? It's, it's, it's applied to everyone who is a part of the seed of, of, of the woman that we'll see later and this promise of salvation, or we could say redemption. And so this, this new covenant, although it's new in one sense, moves back in time and secures for all those um, in, 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 
in the Old Testament anticipatory period, okay? And then just lastly, another statement is, in each of their tests, their faith in the Lord was tested, and it was their faith fundamentally. Are they going to, number one, obey? Uh, number one, are they going to believe the word of God? And then in that belief, are they going to then obey? Okay, let's move on here. So that's all I'm going to say for this principle of probation, but, but we see it clearly in Genesis um, chapter 2. And then we see this, this is a major theme throughout that climaxes in, in Christ's probation and then ultimately securing us the new covenant. Uh, the principle of temptation slash testing and sin. So Voss says this. Voss says this. The process of temptation divides itself into two stages. In the central purpose of the tempter is the injection of doubt into the woman's mind. So this is something to think fundamentally. The opposite of faith is doubt. The opposite of faith is doubt. And so this is the first part of the temptation process. And so this is going to happen throughout all of scripture. In redemptive history, it is, are the people that are being called, are they going to believe the word of God or are they going to doubt? Okay, so this is fundamental to redemptive history. Are we going to believe or are we going to doubt? The doubt suggested in the first stage is of an apparent innocent kind, a doubt as to the question of fact, yet there is already mixed with this a careful disguised allusion to the far more serious kind of doubting, consisting in distrust of God's word recognized as such. So fundamentally, doubt means distrust, distrust in the word. And so this principle of temptation and sin, fundamentally in this, in this, in this principle is this idea of distrust or doubt, and that leads to disobedience. That's what this principle is teaching us. Okay, so this is going to happen throughout all of scripture. This makes a whole lot of sense then in the New Testament um, of why faith is so important and, and why faith is, is a prerequisite for obedience, okay? You cannot obey without trust, okay? And so wherever there is this call to action, even if faith is not present, it's presupposed if you have this framework. Again, so this is why the biblical theological framework is so critical. In this principle of tempting, testing, and sin, distrust and disobedience go hand in hand. Faith and obedience go hand in hand. So in context, in context where there is no, where there is no reference to, to faith, many people, many false cults will say, oh, well, there it's just obedience, salvation by it works. And we want to say no. The presupposition is always. This, this framework, that distrust or faith is behind it, okay? And so you want to ask, Voss does not give a, a specific, does he give a specific example here? I have some examples, so we'll just look at my examples. Um, uh, entering boldly upon the second stage of the temptation, he now seeks to awaken the woman in doubt in the pronounced form of distrust in the, wor in, in the word of God recognizes such. So really it's this, it's this first doubt that leads to distrust. And so um, let's look at some examples. So I'm just going to put some examples up on the, on the uh, there's, that's Voss, page 47. Let's look at some examples. I'm going to go to in several in my mind that are really important that really kind of coalesce this. Um, so scripture references, you can look at Genesis 15, 1 to 6. You can look at Deuteronomy 8, 1 to 6. This is important. Genesis is, is important for Abraham's life. Uh, Deut um, Abraham's at a point in Genesis 15 where he's going to, he, he's doubting and distrusting. And then God gives him the promise again and he believes. He, he pushes aside distrust. Okay. Deuteronomy 8, 1 to 6 is where uh, the Lord through Moses says explicitly to the people that I'm going to test you to see what's in your heart. I'm not going to tempt you to cause you to sin, but I want to test you to see what's in your heart to see if you're going to trust my word. So you can look at Deuteronomy 8, 1 to 6 on your own time. Psalm 95, oh my goodness. Psalm 95, 1 to 11. This is so fundamental. 
uh, you can look at this in connection with, with Hebrews chapter 3, verses 6 to chapter 4, okay? So Psalm 95, 1 to 11 you, is connected with Hebrews 3, 6 to chapter 4, okay? Um, we don't have time to go there. I would love to go there, but we just don't have the time, okay? Um, maybe later. I don't know. We don't have time. I'm sorry. Um, and then, of course, Matthew 4, 1 to 11, which was already mentioned. Um, 1 Peter 1, 3 to 9, the testing of your faith, which is more valuable than gold. There's a fiery test coming upon it to see what's the, to see that it's genuine and the result is going to be in, in uh, eternal life. But what I want us to look at right now is let's go to um, the question that always comes to our mind is, the question that always comes to our mind is especially is the Old Testament. Well, what about, what about Cain? What about Abel? There's no reference to, there's no reference to, to faith, right? So they must be saved on works. And no doubt that that was the perspective of the Jewish people. But what I want us to do here is, remember, I talked about the, 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 the principle of probation. I'm, I'm sorry, the principle of, of, of temptation and sin and testing is that distrust accompanies disobedience, whether or not both are referenced. Um, distrust is behind what leads to disobedience and what leads what is behind obedience is faith and so i'm going to go to one passage of scripture that gives us it's a window into this framework and you can see biblical theology from genesis to to the end um anyone want to guess what passage we're going to go to you have this faith and obedience connection and it's biblical theology from Genesis to, to, to the last days. Anyone want to take a crack at what passage I'm referring to? Genesis 3. Ah, uh, no, well, that's the foundation. But I want, but, but so, so Genesis 3 is the foundation and that's the principle. But where do, can, do we have this window? Explicitly, we see the connection between distrust and disobedience and for sure, uh, uh, faith and obedience. So that's the question. Let's turn to Hebrews chapter 11. Let's turn to Hebrews chapter 11, okay? Um, because what we're going to see in Hebrews chapter 11 is that in many places... Yeah, uh, so what we, we're going to see is that in many instances where in the Old Testament, there's no reference to, there's no reference to faith. In fact, faith is present. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? So it's, 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 it's an incredible window into this, the, into this principle, okay? Into this principle of temptation, testing, and sin. So let me just read. I'm going to read here. Just follow along. I'll highlight as I read so that we can, we can see this. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. So, uh, sorry. The introduction. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, conviction of things not seen. For by it, the people of old received their condemnation, uh, not condemnation, commendation, <laughs> commendation here. So even though the Old Testament text does not reference explicitly faith, it's presupposed, it's present in the background. So by faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what was seen was made out of things, so that what was what is seen was not made out of things visible. Watch this here. By faith, Abel offered. So all we have in Genesis is that Abel presented uh, a sacrifice. But in fact, if we have this framework in our minds, in fact, faith was present. Faith is the means. He was commended as righteous, as righteous. So then also we have here this idea of justification. So this, so justification is present in, in fact, just after Genesis 3. God commending him by accepting gifts, and through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. Look at this. By faith, Abraham was taken up 
No reference of, it, of, of Enoch's faith in uh, Genesis chapter 5. It's not there. It, talks, it says that he walks with God, but there's no reference of faith. Yet, the biblical theological framework, faith is present. <laughs> it's there. Um, uh, look at this. He was commended as having pleased God. You know, works? No, by faith. And without faith, it is impossible. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. By faith, Noah. So Noah is a classic example by all the cults, by all those that want to argue for a works-based, rewards-based salvation. Noah is the par excellence example. It says that he's blameless. He walked, he was righteous. He followed God all his days, right? So it's like, okay, Noah was, Noah, if ever there was someone who was saved by his works, it was Noah. And yet, and yet, and yet, the author of Hebrews, I believe it's Paul, says, no, by faith, by faith. Noah being warned by God, constructed an ark, outward, the works. By faith, Abraham obeyed. By faith, he went. Even Sarah, <laughs> Sarah was one of little faith, right? By faith, <laughs> by faith, Sarah received power to conceive in the old age. Watch this. All of these died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having greeted them afar off and recognizing that they were strangers and exiles on earth. And then it, this just continues. It just continues and it, and it goes on and on and on. So we have, we have Abraham, we have Joseph, we have Jacob, we have Isaac, we have Moses, by faith Moses. Notice how in each of these instances, I'd have to look at the Hebrew. I'd have to look at the Hebrew, but typically the ESV, the ESV tracks um, if by faith is first, let me just take a minute. Let me, let me check to see if, if faith comes first, because that would be even stronger. Just give me one second here. Let me check. Let me check. Yeah, it's by faith. Yeah. First, it's first, right? It's first. Yeah. By yes. faith. By faith. Yeah. Ah, hold on here. Let me see. Yeah. Yeah. No, there it is. There it is. Yeah. So, so it's always beginning. So the word order in Hebrew, in Greek is, is sometimes significant. So in each of these instances, the faith is actually fronted. It's fronted. It's, it's being highlighted. It's being accented. And so you have this by faith, by faith, by faith, the people crossed the Red Sea. <laughs> by faith, the walls of Jericho fell. By faith, Rahab. And so what we see here is this, is this is a picture that when we look at Scripture and someone does a good work, and it's, and it's a genuine work, it's, it's, it's genuinely done um, before God, it's pleasing in God's sight, the Scripture refers to it as very positively. What, what, a, a bad interpretation is not to consider the biblical theological framework, not to consider... Um, not to consider how the scripture understands oftentimes a presupposed structure that must be true. Um, uh, and this would be the proof is in the pudding, okay? And so many people will say, no, we can't look at the New Testament. We just look at the Old Testament. And they say, no, Abel, he saved himself. Um, uh, uh, for sure, Noah. For sure, Noah, um, he had good works. And that's, those works are those that saved. And we want to say, Biblical theology prevents us because here, if we accept that scripture is the word of God, what scripture is telling us here is that every good work done in the Old Testament, big takeaway, every good work done in the anticipatory period was done by faith. <laughs> Everyone tracking there with me? Everyone sees that. I hope you see that. Um, this is not a comprehensive list. This is a fundamental list. So you can look at the rest of these in your own time. I hope that you see that, that this principle, 
excuse me. I hope that you see that this principle that Voss is pointing out is really throughout scripture. And so he talks about, now Voss right now is focusing on the negative component that behind disobedience, behind temptation is distrust, okay? So I'm accenting the positive. I'm accenting the positive. And that's why, that's why I, this would be an example where I'm adding to a little bit of what Voss is saying. I'm taking Voss's principle and adding the positive component. So we could say the principle of temptation and testing. So from a positive perspective, if they overcome the temptation, if they overcome the test, it's this faith and trust is, is in the background. It's, it's underneath the action. Is everyone really tracking with what I'm saying here? So maybe here I'm, I'm, I'm adding a little bit to Voss. I'm adding a little bit here, but I'm adding it in, I'm really adding, I'm just, I'm standing on his work and making a, a positive, I'm making a positive uh, inference, okay? I'm making a positive inference, okay? For sure, Voss is emphasizing the negative. And so throughout scripture, when you see disobedience, what you should be thinking is that there is distrust. There is distrust in the promises of God. There is distrust in the word of God. And that is preceding the disobedience. So the one famous person that we should really identify this with is Esau. That's why you don't really see a lot of, although there is negative sin in Esau's life, it seems like at the end he's reconciled and he's happy, this or that. But in, in Hebrews, Esau is a profane, wicked man that finds no chance for repentance. And so in all of Esau's acts, the despising of the birthright, the, um, the taking of Canaanite women, okay, there is distrust, there is disbelief in the, in the covenant of his father. He does not believe in the promises of Yahweh in the Isaac, the Isaac, or the Abrahamic covenant. There is doubt, there's distrust, and that's why he despises. That's why he goes and gets the foreign women, okay? Is everyone tracking there with me? So there's many trajectories you can go with this, okay? Is that making sense? Are we, are, are we clear there? Okay, let's, I want to finish and then we'll take a break. I want to finish here. Let's, let's, let's finish the principle of death. Now, the principle of death, it was a hard read for Voss. Um, and so I just want to highlight some conclusions, some, some, um, some concluding points for Voss. Um, and I think that these really get at what Voss was trying to say. These are this. So let me just quote, make some quotations here. Um, it was intimate. Uh, it was intimated that death carried with it separation from God, since sin issued both in death and in exclusion from the garden. If life consisted with communion with God, on the principle of opposites, death must have been interpretable as separation from God. This is a big takeaway. And so that's why, that's why in the New Testament, uh, death, eschatological death is in the judgment being sent away from God. Okay, so we see that in Revelation 21, uh, the second death being eternally separated, okay? Um, I'll go to one example so that we can see this idea of separation, okay? We can really see the separation. But so, so physical death, of course, is the opposite of life, but it's always connected with the presence of God. It's always connected with communion with God, okay? So, it, it, and it makes logical sense. If God is the life giver, if he is the life sustainer, to choose another path, to choose another wisdom, to choose another way, you're choosing death, right? And of course, there's the consequence for disobeying. Death is the punishment. So there's multiple trajectories we can go here. Voss says, in other words, expulsion from the garden means expulsion to death. The root of death is in having been sent forth from God. We should also be considering the foundation of the coming of the Lord and judgment. Both of these are present in the garden. So I, I am also adding a little bit to Voss here. You see that um, in principle form, right? So man sins, they fall, and then you have the coming of the Lord into his garden, and then there's the judgment. So throughout scripture, there's the warning in Israel that if they are disobe disobedient, God will come and judge, right? Um, in, in the New Testament, there's the warning of God coming in judgment. Jesus says, you know, 
warns his church to be awake, to be vigilant, because he's coming and he's going to judge the living and the dead. So again, this is another uh, maybe added trajectory I'm adding here, but you have this, the coming of the Lord in the garden to judge um, is also, we could also include that in this principle of death, that God comes and judges his people um, and then he punishes them. And, and always in the punishment, there is also interlaces of grace. And we'll talk about that um, in the next PowerPoint, okay? Um, so scriptural references here. We're just going to go to one and we're going to take our break. We're going to go to Ephesians 2, verses 1 to 10. You could also look at Romans 8, 1 to 12. You can look at Revelation, of course, 20, 1 to 11. But let's go ahead. Let's go ahead and look really quick at Ephesians so that you see this. Let's, let's look at Ephesians. So Ephesians chapter 2. So look at this, okay? Look, look at this connection here. So we're looking at the principle of death. You were, uh, you were dead, right? So dead, and what are you dead in? You're dead in, the sphere is in trespasses and sins, following the course of the world, following the prince of the power of the, of the air, the spirit that is now in, at work in the sons of disobedience, okay? So um, thinking here, fellowship and communion is not with God, but with the prince of the power of the air, or we could say Satan. Everyone tracking there with me? So, but you have this connection with, with death. Do you see? So it's separation from God, among whom we once lived in the passions of the flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, were by nature children of wrath. So here, this is uh, children under judgment. like the rest of mankind. But God being rich in his mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive. <laughs> so I, I want us to see this principle, this principle of death that is in the garden is also true of us spiritually. Even though we would be alive physically, we are dead spiritually. This, this principle is in effect. Okay, and it's the it's it's in it's in a more real sense because we're we're we were if you look here this is this is a uh, separated from God. We're separated, especially because of the judgment. Right now that we are we are made alive. Look at this. He has raised us up and seated us in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. <laughs> so now we're in, we've passed from death to life. Does everyone see that? So it's this principle of, of, of now we were focusing the negative, but now we're looking at the positive. And this is, this is a now, this is presence with God. And of course, we're not, we're still here, but we're present with God because of our, this is our union with Christ. We are seated in the heavenly places in Christ. <laughs> our representatives there in Christ, okay? So just moving along here, just to really bring out the separation idea. So look at this. So look at what Paul says. Therefore, therefore remember. So th the key word is therefore. So this, this is the foundation for the therefore. Okay, so I want to see that the, the, the two passages are directly connected. Therefore, remember at one time you were Gentiles in the flesh called uncircumcision. Remember that you were at one time... 
separated from, uh, from Christ, alienated, alienated. This is this is sep this is separation ideas here. Separated from the Commonwealth of Israel, strangers of the covenants of promise, having no hope. without God. So this here is a reminder that prior to our coming to salvation, this principle of death was at work in us in, in the realest sense. And it's not physical death, it's spiritual death and it's separation from God, okay? And so we have these concepts throughout all of scripture. And so when we look at death, when we look at this idea, this physical idea of death, this is so, so practical. Let's get practical here, okay? Physical death should signify, should remind all of us, uh, it's a token, right? Going back to the garden. It's a token of the greater reality of spiritual death, spiritual separation from God. Is everyone getting that big picture here? And so practically speaking, when we have death in our congregations, when we, when we see death, we should be thinking, we should be sharing with others the greater truth, the greater reality that we are, at one time, we were spiritually separated. Now, perhaps someone is still not in Christ. And so that's that's the call to share the gospel. That's the call to share with them. When someone says, when you say, you know, right now you're dead and doing your own thing. No, I'm as alive as can be. No, you're, you're spiritually dead. You are separated. You are separated from God. Does everyone see, does everyone see it? it? It moves into the practical. It really moves into the practical. Okay. Any thoughts or comments? Is is everyone tracking with me? I'm really taking Voss and I'm just giving specific examples here. You know, Voss does not have this. I'm, I'm really adding to Voss. I, I hope everyone can see this. And, and the purpose of me share, sharing this is so that we see that this that although these are deep truths, this this has great practical ramifications for our ministry understanding this let me just take a minute let's let's discuss for a minute and then we'll, we'll take a break anyone want to add anyone want to to, to include or, or or has a thought clarification tip. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, considering this uh concept of death as uh, expulsion the, they started with expulsion from the garden and uh, separation is there a way that this act of god to expel Adam from the Garden of Eden was in, in some way a mercy or an act of grace to him. Yeah, absolutely. So, so, so he can he can he can he can benefit from the from the fruit of uh, the earth, whatever uh, he 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 does with the with the fruit of the earth. Because if he stayed uh, in in the garden with God's uh, wrath already present. He will not live. Yes, much exactly. He, he will that, not live. Yeah, no. Um, he, he cannot remain in the presence of God. And that's actually why we're going to see later in the Noahic period, after God, he, he, he makes the conclusion, man is wicked. You know, so, so God withdraws his presence from the earth in one sense and gives, extends common grace so that because otherwise he's gonna to have to keep killing them. He's gonna to have to keep killing them. So he's gonna say, so like, no, you're you're absolutely right. In, in in many ways, God driving man from his presence is is an act of grace. It's an act excellent observation, Corey Boboy. That's that's really profound. That's really good. Yeah, actually, sir Dave, I just you know, reading verse is really good, and I just realized this just just you know, this couple of days. Because um, yeah. Uh, just realize that if 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 uh, the original intent of of God, making, you know, making man is is to establish a covenant of work to them to 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 Adam, and he should also exercise the covenant of works uh, that he originally designed, but because he failed to do it, so the privilege I I, I put it that way the privilege of you know working unexhaustibly. In the original yeah. intent, it no longer happened. 
And that's yeah. why when when man fall, God has to do something. Yeah. God has to do yeah. something. Number one is to ex to expose, uh, you know, the expulsion of the garden. Yeah. And then uh, because God is so concerned about His image bearer, so yeah. He would establish the covenant of grace. And then, wow! Yeah. I said, wow! This this is really, I mean, it's yeah. No, I, I, I just yeah. realized if that. If you if you notice uh, from the start, perhaps uh, for us we we always were it was always understood by us that when uh, God uh, expelled Adam and Eve from the garden, it was a punishment. Now we are yeah. saying that it was a grace yeah, to mankind. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It was a, yeah. a grace to mankind. So, so that's, so, that's, the, that's the amazing truth. Now we are learning. Yeah. So so th that that's going to be a perfect segue. Let's take a break. That's a segue into the the first redemptive act right because the first redemptive act it's judgment and grace you watch chapter four judgment and grace it's interwoven yeah so <laughs> let's take a break let's take a break use the bathroom and um we're gonna segue into chapter four so um yeah let's take a 10 minute break so what time is it right now 7 30 so let's take a break to, to and, and let's come back at 7 40 and we will have our breakout session to discuss um, to discuss chapter four, and then we're going to uh, look at the judgment and the grace. Both are present. <laughs> okay, let's go. Okay, we got to get started because it's already seven forty-four. So, I created I created four breakout rooms. So, breakout room number one, uh, Jesus, you'll be the leader for breakout room number one. For breakout room number two. Uh, Koya Bobo, you're the leader. Breakout room number three will be Henry Kwa. And breakout room number four will be uh, Kea. You all, you'll be the leader there, okay? So what I want you to do is I want you to, it's just going to be for 10 to 15 minutes at the most. I want you to first discuss your reading. So what I want you, each, each of you just to share what's something you liked about Voss, what's something, then what's something you dislike, and then maybe a question. Okay, so that's, that's the first part of, of the breakout session. Then if you still have time, you can go into the scripture reading and that assignment. But, but the main point I want now is for you to, to discuss Voss. Maybe you have, you know, I want you to become more oriented with him. Okay, so your first priority is what everyone just go through. Just I like this. I li I didn't like that. Um, and then also to ask questions. And then if you if you run out of time and you I mean if you if you have a lot of time, you can also um, discuss the scripture reading. So I'm gonna go ahead and put you into the rooms. Okay. So all right, great. Okay. So let's just go through. So we'll do um, uh, observations. So we'll begin with group number. I started with group number one last time. Let's start with group number four, so that we're we're being fair. So um, your observations, yes, if we have a question, uh, reading, go ahead. Oh, Pastor, I think we're talking about chapter four, right? Yes. Okay. Um, well, uh, I'll be honest, Pastor Tim, me yeah. and Pastor Glenn weren't able to <laughs> submit. And um, it was only Tita Shoni and um, Sir Nas who was able to uh, give their uh, a reflection. Okay. So uh, that... Tita Shoni actually, well, uh, yes, uh, no, she, go, yeah, go, go she ahead. talked about, yes, she, she, she shared to us about uh, when she, she uh, the woman having, uh, having to deliver in pain, and then she was saying okay. that at first, she was thinking that it was a curse, but actually, it's a blessing because it means that it, there's the continuity of yeah. or the giving of the life, yes. And there is, uh, and at the end, the Redeemer will uh, come from the seed of the woman. So, there. Um, another is, um, she also shared to us, which I also agree that, um, the curse uh, regarding Adam having yeah. to, uh, what do you call this, to toil. Yes. Uh, it's not actually a curse. Rather, it's a blessing because it, it, it means that he will sustain life. So it's like Eve giving life and then 
aid them sustaining life. No, so that's really that's that's really good. That's excellent. And so you see, you see, you see both. Let me rewrite this here. So you see here, you see the curse component, or we could say judgment. But then you also see the, let's use a blue here. You see the grace. Right, so the two are interwoven. That's really good. So then the second observation was, oh. good, sorry. Yes, um, that's actually when you were saying that um, it's Sir Naz's uh, observation. He shared to us that in the first, uh, in page 53, there's this, um, as you have said, Pastor Tim, the in, uh, it's in the uh, yeah. justice and grace together. Yeah. Uh huh. You could read it from there. Yes. Yeah. So, excellent. Th uh, that's it. And also, <laughs> justice and grace. Yes. And then, um, may I continue? Uh, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, Sir Nas also um, shared in page fifty-five um, his message regarding trust in God's grace and power to bring deliverance from sin. So. Uh, <sighs> there and then uh the question that actually all of us uh he wanted to further and also me we wanted to further uh ask is regarding the seed the seed yeah the seed of the woman is it really that just the elect oh good okay so okay yeah so let's let's look here so huge emphasis on trusting god for the promise, right? The promise. And then, so, so then the question that you have concerns, the question is, is the, is the seed, the elect only, right? Yes, Pastor Tim. Okay, great. Excellent. No, this is really good. I, I, I hope that if you didn't have these observations and if you didn't have this question, you should write this down. I mean, this is really good. Okay, so let's do, do group number number three. Group number three. So that would be Pastor Henry. What do you have? If you have the same, that's fine. Uh, Henry, you're muted. Sorry. Uh, Pastor Sunny. Ah, yes, uh, actually, we, we actually we had our observer to be honest. We have our observation from ch chapter three and chapter four. So, <laughs> so we're just going to be, but um, so just chapter here's four. The thing that we, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, just chapter four. We, we, <clears throat> we like the conclusion of Voss here in chapter four when he says that that curse, that curse, that curse is the, is the ground for man's sake. And and then he said that uh, you know that he said that with the curse with the curse con consists in that it breeds well after all I, I mean the curse that uh wait 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 just for a moment he concluded actually that uh, uh, the grace mingling in, in that in that in that aspect that that, that the that the, the, the elements of grace mingling with the curse consists in that the bread will 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 after all be bread. So uh, we like that conclusions very much uh, regarding on the how God is so gracious to to Adam uh, after the fall. Still, still, still the grace of God uh, mingling with 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 with. With the with the fall of, of, of human, and and also uh, I would like to point out the 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 seeds of, of Satan, which is yeah. which is it, it really opens it opens me personally it opens my mind that the the you know the the debatable passage of Ezekiel, yeah. And here Vos is 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 <laughs> it's really it's, it's really mind mind blowing and it's really illuminating when when he says that uh, that 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 the the power of evil should not be interpreted within the human race because yeah. the, the evil power is collective 
and and Satan is is the head of of it. So I cannot think of something that that Satan is the king of those, um, you know, yeah. say for example Tyre, uh, you know, uh, the king of Tyre. Yeah. Satan is behind of those of that. Yeah. So therefore, we conclude theologically or that yeah. it really talks about 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 Satan. Well, yeah. So no. So that's really good, Sonny. And and we'll just we're going to discuss Ezekiel twenty eight on Sunday night. We we postponed it, but no, because I went back and looked as well. And yeah, I your comment actually is 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 really good. I didn't really think about that, but the idea that the evil kingdom, this is really the the center. It's centered upon Satan in this context here. And yeah, that's a really good observation. So let's think about that as well, especially for our discussion on Sunday night. Um, but that's a really good observation. And, and that does, so the one thing I do wanna say is that, uh, you know, it is really important for us to see not only the, 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 the sin, the judgment, the sin, the judgment and the grace that's given to mankind, but also, the present of the sin of Satan, his kingdom, because that's another major theme throughout scripture. And so what Sonny was talking about that Satan was behind the king of Tyre. And Paul will talk about that in Ephesians 6. There is a warning in for the leaders, right? That you shouldn't choose a novice else he falls, you know, he's puffed up with pride and he falls into the condemnation of Satan, as in the same judgment as Satan received. Again, going back to the, so it's, anyway, so I don't want to belabor that point, but that's really good observation, Sonny. Let's be thinking about that and we'll discuss that on Sunday night more, but, but that's a really good observation. So let's go on now to, to group number two. Koya Bullboy, what do you have for us? Um, only, there were only three of us present. <laughs> Who shared, Just give me one. And, Just give me one. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we shared. We we shared the same uh, on the grace that when although God was giving punishment, He was also grace, and uh, it was added that uh, God is really introducing us to the to the principle of grace with what He did to Adam and Eve after they they sinned and they disobeyed. Uh, since nobody asked, uh, raised the question. May I just point out my question that I submitted in my in my reading report? Go ahead. Can I just use it? Yeah. My question there was about the almost the last sentence uh, on page 53. It seems more possible to seek the seed of the serpent outside of the human race. The power of evil is a collective power, a kingdom of evil, of which Satan is the head. So my question there is, how do we explain the creature evil creature that is in human in the human body yeah yeah so so no great question boy boy so i'm going to say i'm just going to give you a little hit, t tidbit here my answer is both and <laughs> both and <laughs> <laughs> okay. so so it's both it's both and there is an accent on it's Satan's kingdom. It's the power of darkness, but 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 it also includes the parts of the human race. And and we're going to go to several passages tonight that we see that. But um, yeah. So I think that that Voss is a little bit again. So I, I'm I'm given actually maybe two or three caveats to Voss, but I do agree fundamentally that it is the kingdom of Satan. So it's not the human race apart from Satan. It's in the context underneath Satan. And so I do really like what Sonny mentioned about Satan being, high, being behind the king of Tyre. And I really think th there is something to be said there. And not only is Satan behind the king of Tyre, but the king of Tyre's behavior is pointing back to Satan. It's the same sin. It's the same type of fall. So it, let's be thinking about that. But so the question is, is uh, who is the seed? Hey, go, go, go ahead, go ahead. Satan was also behind the serpent. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, no. So Voss's perspective, and correct me if I'm wrong, it's that Satan possesses the serpent, Diba. That's the that's the, that's his position. And that's my position yes. as well. So yeah. Yes. And so 
And so this is where the physical token, the physical token is the serpent. So when you see the snake, when you see the snake, <laughs> that's why he's represented, the snake is Satan. That's why he's represented because it's the physical, yeah. So um, uh, who is the seed as, as in um, offspring? No, that's really good. That's really good, Koya Bullboy and also Pastor Henry. Uh, group number one, do you want to add anything? Yeah, um, Pastor, um, Pastor Tim. Uh, actually, uh, Pastor Danny have a uh, same uh, observation with uh, Pastor Sonny, but uh, he the additional is one of the motives of the of Satan is to sabotage motives or oh, to sabotage. Yes, then with uh, I and Pastor Claudio, we have this thing about the grace that uh, Kaya mentioned a while ago. So, but I'd like to add the idea of Pastor Chalmer about the, the result of sin, which is shame and fear. Yes, I like that. So the, the result of sin is shame and fear. Yeah. Excellent observation. Sure. Then, um, oh yeah, we, we mentioned already about the seed of woman. Then uh, we have a from, from same with uh, Pastor Chalmer and Pastor Danny. Uh, they have one to ex explore or have a purse that is about, uh, I think, the last part of the page 54. It's about, uh, about Mary. Yeah. Yes. They want to investigate that yeah the one mentioned by uh, by by voice about the Rom romanist commentator and according to pastor charm chalmer uh, he's referring to saint jerome a one of the prominent person in roman catholic yeah so it's from the translation of the vulgate so this is the latin vulgate yeah, that's the one thing that uh, pastor chalmer said that he wants to study about hebrew the septuagint more to investigate more yeah. on that yeah, no, and, and to be honest with you, with those of you who are gifted in languages, what I would say is that, especially in a Catholic context, uh, you know, you will see a lot of, of false doctrine in the Catholic Church originating from the bad translations or deficient translations because they're going back to the Latin. They're not going back to uh, Hebrew and Greek and Aramaic. And so the bad translations... Uh, uh, or, or maybe not bad, but deficient or inaccurate. They're not going back to the original inspired um, autograph uh, source, source language. Um, Ray, you have a question. Go ahead. Yeah, Tim, uh, this is just one of the, I don't know if it's more observation, but it's one thing I noticed in verse um, 22. It said, that then the Lord said, behold, the man has become like one of us. In knowing good and evil now lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever so with, with this verse does this mean that god had never intended men to live forever at the time so so it, 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 now there is never an explicit statement that man can eat of the tree of, of life. And Voss will actually say that it's it's a token and God's and God's intention. I'm just gonna mute you right because there's some feedback. Um, but so God's intention is for it's God's intention that it's a token, everything in the garden is pointing to that higher blessedness, the higher blessedness um, that transcends the physical. Okay. So what what I first want to say is that according to God's eternal plan. We have to say it's clear that he that he did not want man to, you know, to, to eat, especially after the sin. Okay. Now, if you're the specific question, like did God was God unaware? You know, I, I, again, I would say that this is um, uh, it's a story, and so and so, um, I would not be making deep theological truths. In connection with with the story, do you see? Do you see? I'm saying we we could make some deep theological assessments, but because going back to the framework, going back to the framework, going back to um, the the promise fulfillment, the anticipation finality, 
we can't because Genesis, especially Genesis 1 to 11, it's in a very primeval, fundamental form. You have to wait to see how God is going to reveal what, what exactly is going on. And so I would say that that could be one potential interpretation, right? But as we see the unfolding of God's plan, we would clearly have to discredit it. So that would be my answer. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, because I, I did encounter in one of the um, uh, pages I read in Boston chapter 3, he did make mention about this particular scenario. Yeah. About, yeah. Anyway. Yeah, no, that's really good. That's really good. And sometimes, sometimes Voss is just, he's, he's adding other statements, but it's not, it's not like a conclusion. It's almost like he's just sharing information and it's a hard, it's hard sometimes. So yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's part of that, but no, great, great observation. You know, if, if ever you don't understand boss, the best thing is to go to the end of the chapter to see what his conclusion is and then just accept it or, or, or dis disagree, but <laughs> that's what I do. That's what I do. I just, I'm like, I'm not sure what he's saying. And I go to wait to see the conclusion. That's, that's, <laughs> okay 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 all right good okay now this is great i am so happy i this is this really makes me happy you 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 made some excellent observations these were same observations that i had so let's go ahead let's go through the powerpoint that i have and um we'll just we'll we'll, ex, we'll expand on some of these things maybe it'll just be like an amen it'll be an amen like yeah okay we, we're all in agreement here um so let's just, uh, let's go ahead and go into the PowerPoint. Okay, so um, this is actually now uh, session number six. So this is the mode and content of the first redemptive special revelation. And so we're a little bit behind, but it's okay. We should still finish tonight. Um, so uh, we finished the breakout room discussion. And so now we're gonna look at the notes and um, um, probably with the notes, we'll look at some scriptural references. And then at the end, I hope I hope that you can come back as a breakout room and have a finish, just a follow up discussion. Um, and if you want to share other things, and then also you 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 can pray uh, together. So, um, chapter four. So, uh, just some things here. So we're still in this. We're in um, lat, earlier tonight and last week we did number one pre redemptive. Now we're on to uh, number two, which is the first mode and content of first redemptive special. Revelation. And so here, there are three major things. Uh, the three curses, the seed, idea of seed, and then number three is going to be this idea of suffering. And in the suffering, we're also looking at grace mixed with curse. Okay, so those are the kind of the highlight bullet points of chapter number four. Okay, so um, first thing that I really want to highlight is this um, Voss brings out and this is correct. The term redemption is used in anticipation. So in Genesis uh, three, there's no reference explicitly to redemption, but it's, it's it, the concept is present, although the term is not used. Okay, the concept is present. So what, what we wanna be looking for is, is the concept of redemption present in, in this judgment of Genesis chapter three? And so he says, it does not occur until the Mosaic period, we employ it because God's saving approach and dealing with man immediately appear. And so we see this, this saving promise given to us. And so that's why we use the word redemption. And so that's why you'll see the history of redemption, the history of spe special revelation, um, redemptive history, uh, things, uh, things of uh, terminology like that. And then this is fundamental, both justice and grace God's justice and grace are turned towards fallen humanity, okay? And so here, this is what many of you picked up on, so I'm just re restating what you guys highlighted. Uh, there is judgment and promise. Now, this is in poetic form. So in poetic form, it's not uh, poetry. There's a lot of figures. It's, it's, it's somewhat veiled, okay? So the genre here is poetry. How can we know if you don't know Hebrew or if you don't know Hebrew, how can we know that that this portion of Genesis is poetry? How can we know? What 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 structure. what's the structure? Okay, and what what specifically? Speak to me about that. Broken lines. Broken lines. Yeah, 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 yeah. So so if everyone can can be thinking, um, 
about this. If you look at Genesis chapter 3, I'm going to just show my, my Bible here. Everyone can see it here. Can everyone see? There's, there's block text and then there's staggered text. We've talked about this before. Um, and so the, the, the block text signifies prose or just narrative. And then when you have the offsetting text, that signifies Hebrew poetry. And you also have in the New Testament, you can also have the, the, the poetic form in, in Greek as well. And so I'm looking here, when, when the Lord God speaks from Genesis 3.14, until verse 19, it's all in broken, staggered text. That tells us it's in, it's in poetic form. And thus, if it's in poetic form, it's not to say we don't take it literally, wooden literally, but that it could be, the meaning could be veiled. It could be a mystery until it's revealed one day. Do you see it? So I'm using now gospel language. The gospel was, was hidden and now revealed. And so in poetry, Dibat, when you, wherever you study poetry, they say, is that literal or figurative, right? <laughs> if you've ever studied poetry, right? Um, uh, it, it can be very confusing when you look at the poets, like, what is that? What is he saying? You know, so, 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 um, and that's the, that's the same in, 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 in Hebrew poetry. And so um, we do just need to be aware if you're taking hermeneutics, identification of genre is very important. Okay, so this is why we have the class of hermeneutics. If you have not had it yet, we will have it. We've already had Hermeneutics 1. Uh, it's on YouTube if you want to watch those, um, those sessions. And then also we will have a Hermeneutics 2 one day where we'll go through and just really look at the different genres and unpack different texts. So a, a little bit of a plug for another class for another time. Um, uh, throughout the curses, God's grace is evident. It's evident for humanity, but not for the serpent. <laughs> okay, so it's like... Only death and destruction for the serpent. No way out for the serpent. Sayang. But for, 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 but for man, God's grace is evident. And here's the thing. It all depends on perspective. We, we read this is all bad and all curses. But when someone is really reading carefully, you see that grace just, just shines through. And so this is an encouragement for us to, to read carefully and to read from a God-centered perspective, not focusing on us primarily, but but for, but on a God-centered approach, looking to see what the text actually says, what the text actually means, who it's applied to, and then later we can apply it to ourselves. Um, and that's Boss Biblical Theology, page fifty-two. That last bullet point I added, so that was um, that was uh, my 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 addition. Um, there are, I forgot to mention A and B. A and B, the justice is shown in the penal character of the three curses. So there is definitive judgment. There is a curse given to each participant. So this is something big. God does not remove judgment. In order for God to be just, his judgment will always come. If God does not pass judgment, he is not a righteous judge. Even in the gospel, even in our salvation, God's judgment is comes, okay? So even in God being gracious and merciful, that does not remove his judgment. And then part B, the grace of mankind lies implicitly in the curse upon the tempter. And also there's, there's grace um, also given in the other two curses, but really the, the grace shines through in the curse of the tempter because it because in that curse, the complete curse of the tempter, there's a promise to undo the curse that was given to us. So let's be thinking about that. Um, we can further obser observe at this point how special revelation. So here we go. How special revelation attaches itself to general re re revelation. Okay, so here we're looking at the connection between special and general. Listen to this. The feeling of shame and fear were produced in fallen mankind by general revelation. So they had uh, fear and shame. Then God comes and he gives them, in the interview with man, God gives them special revelation and it reveals, it reveals the rest. Do you see what I'm saying? So general revelation is not enough after the fall. Okay? God has to come and he has to deal with man. And that's through special revelation. So now, of course, 
Christ has come, the canon is closed. And so this is all the more important reason why when we sin, um, we, general revelation can expose our sin when we look around us, when we see different things in nature. But at the end of the day, we have to go to the word of God to fill in the gaps because of our fallenness. Okay, so this is really, we see the connection here. The general revelation is combined. What was the, what was the general revelation in this fall? Someone give to me what the general revelation was. Maybe Voss mentions it. I think he does. What is the general revelation that reveals the, the fear and shame? The nakedness. The nakedness, exactly. When, when they saw that they were naked, they had the fear and the shame. And that's general revelation. So when they realized, when they, when they looked, because general revelation is God's creation, right? So them looking, I'm not being crass or crude, when they looked at each other and saw their nakedness for the first time, or at least they were aware of their nakedness, that general revelation in nature, Diba, they're both part of creation. They realize that they had sinned and then they had fear and shame. And there's a third component we're going to talk about that Voss doesn't bring out. Um, uh, but then God fills in the blank when he comes. He fills in the gap with special revelation. So I hope everyone sees that, okay? So um, our nakedness should be a sign to us of our sin condition. Everyone tracking with us? So this, this would be another token teaching us a spiritual truth, okay? I think. <laughs> yes, yeah, so guilt is the third one. Yeah. So let's finish here. It should also be noted. So this is, I added, I added the also guilt. It should, be, it should be noted, however, Vol says that the shame and fear, also guilt, operate with reference to God. The man and the woman hide themselves, not from each other, but from the presence of God. So it's that shame and fear in the presence of God. That's what, that's what Voss says. Um, uh, I add this. There is the presence of fear, shame, and guilt. What is guilt? Many times we confuse guilt with shame. When we feel bad, that's not guilt. Guilt is, guilt is the awareness that we broke a law. Boy, boy, correct me if I'm wrong, Diba. Guilt is the awareness that we broke a law, Diba. Ah! Shame is when we feel bad, okay? Fear is when you're afraid of the punishment, okay? So there is also the presence of guilt. How can we be sure of this? Guilt is the recognition that one has violated a law. Notice they did not lack the understanding that they broke God's law. <laughs> Rather, <laughs> they make excuses and blame someone else. <laughs> Blaming someone else reveals to us the awareness that what they did was wrong. If they didn't know what they did was wrong, they would be like, oh, what, what are they, you know, what's going on? They, they, would, they would be ignorant, okay? Um, uh, this is the fundamental characteristic of someone who is guilty and recognizes what he has done, but not necessarily repented or contrite. <laughs> Koya Boboy, come step in here if ever, if ever. Koya Boboy is the leader here in, in well, add something if you want. Add something if you want. This is this is quite complex in the in the criminal system because uh, basically we do not know what's in the mind of yeah. a person. That's why you cannot convict a person because that is what is in his mind. Nobody can read the yeah. mind except God. That yeah. is why in criminal law we are more particular about the act and the yeah. motive for the action. Yeah. The, the two has to go together. Even if the action is bad, but there is no motive, you can be acquitted. One can be acquitted if there is no motive because uh, on the action that result that uh, resulted uh, therein. So uh, the action without the motive may may exculpate you from criminal prosecution. But yeah, yeah. if the mind is already guilty of something else, that's different. Yeah, no, See, that's only good. God yeah. knows. Only yeah. God knows about yeah. what is in the frame of our mind. Yeah. That is the essence of this guilt. That is the essence of the guilt. Yeah. No, that's really good. That's really good, Koya Bulboy. And at the end of the day, only God knows. You know, at the same time, though, we are, it's, 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 God has opened up us to see what's in many ways what's in their mind because they're making excuses. Uh, we do have a special viewpoint into the story supernaturally. And so, um, 
Um, uh, and for sure, God as the one who sees the mind. Um, so that is that is a difference between criminal law, physical law, and and God's eternal law. That is a, that is a difference there. Um, Voss, biblical theology, page fifty-two. But the last point is is that that's more of my my commentary, my my addition. Okay. So number one, the, the curse of the serpent. So there's going to be four things that Voss highlights, and I want to highlight this for us. I want you to, to think about it. Number one is the divine initiative in the work of the deliverance. So notice how God does not tell Adam to do it. He does not say that man's going to do it. God says, I will put enmity. So it's, it's in, in the curse of the serpent, um, God is going to judge and, and, and destroy the serpent one day in finality, okay? Um, but in doing so, it's going to be his act. He will take the initiative to do it. It cannot come from us. So this is really the grace of God. In judging the serpent, he is going to act to, to, to undo this evil that is now in the world. This is, this is incredibly powerful. And this really speaks to our salvation, our, our redemptive, the redemption that we have from God as being God's work fundamentally and not ourselves. Um, we cannot save ourselves and it's in Genesis. There's nothing Adam and Eve can do to save themselves or to destroy the work of Satan, the serpent. Does everyone see that here? We are completely incapable of doing it. God has to act again, and he, he promises that he will. Number two, the essence of the deliverance consists of the reversal of attitude assumed by man towards the serpent and God. And so part of this, this deliverance includes man and Adam and Eve sided with the serpent, and they distrusted God. What is the opposite of distrust? Faith. And so there, there has to be this work in which the man and the woman are now on God's side in the sense that they have faith and they are, they are um, trusting in God more than in the, the serpent. So this is why we talk about the source of faith as coming from God. Does everyone see that there? In order for us to be delivered, it, we have to have this change of attitude and that has to be the work of God. Now we exercise the faith, but the change of mindset in order for us to then exercise the faith has to come from God. And so um, this is oftentimes uh, the uh, an emphasis of, yeah, go ahead, go ahead, yeah. Okay, sir, can I, I clarify something? Because when yeah. I read the uh, chapter three, I don't see any violation of the strength there. It was not mentioned. Is there any, any, any mention? Any, any violation of the what? Of the law, I don't know, because if you read uh, the chapter ch uh, chapter three, there's a mention about uh, the violation of Adam, violation of Eve. But uh, in terms of judgment, I think in verse uh, starting fourteen yeah. down yeah. to uh, so in 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 line yes yeah, fourteen fourteen when when God judged the serpent, what he did not mention about what's the violation of the serpent. Yeah. So so, my, so yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. I think it was the deception that he made. It was the, the reason why he was judged for that, right? So, well, hold on. I, I, I miss, Jesus, repeat your question. I cut you off. I apologize. And Ray, Ray kind of, kind of re, 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 repeat yeah. your question. I, the question is, what's really the violation of the serpent there? Because it's not mentioned, really. Unlike yes. with the man yeah. and the woman. Yeah. Yeah, so, so, yeah. so, so we, we, in many ways, it's not clear. And then, of course, it's debated if, if it becomes clear later in, in other passages. But, but what we could say for sure is, I mean, in later, later scripture clarifies this, you know, he lied. He, he, he lied about the word of God. He, he, he corrupted the word of God. He, he, he deceived. So, so. Um, later, we'll see that 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 um, deceit, lying—that's all part of breaking, violating God's law. But remember, this is in um, fundamental, uh, uh, um, anticipatory seed form. So, not all those questions are readily answered in this text. 
it's the once we look at the full framework, once we look at how God God will later reveal if if we see Isaiah Isaiah 14 more debated, but or Ezekiel Ezekiel 28 um, Ezekiel 28 being as a further revelation of what's occurring, we we, we get a better picture. I don't know if that's really helping. Hey, is, is 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 that is yeah. that adding? Some yeah, 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 yeah. It's good. Yeah, but so can we say that the the serpent there is already a fallen nature, a fo fallen a cre uh, cre creature? Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely, uh, absolutely, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Before and, the tem yeah. before the tem the fallen of man, he's already a fallen creature, the serpent there. Yeah. So so again, you would have Corey but go ahead, then then I'll answer. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, may I just comment on the on the on the question? Uh, was that uh... Jesus? Jesus, Jesus. Because he was asking, what was the violation of the serpent? Uh, if we use if we use a common day term, I would use the word inducement. Because Satan really induced Eve to violate God's command by by inserting a very subtle words that did really God said. It's something like that. It's it's a kind of inducement. In, in the present law system, it is it is like an entrapment. You entrap a person, and that is a crime. Oh, okay, 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 okay. That's, that's, I, that's, I, that's I, to I, me, is the essence of the violation of, of the serpent. Yeah, I understand yeah. The, the trap. Yeah, yeah, good, good, good. I, I get that. No, it could be the instigator. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think in, in, in verse 1, there's, uh, the serpent asks, in the in a clever way when he said did god really or did god actually say you shall not any eat yeah you shall not eat any tree in the garden which is not yeah. the question uh, which is not the the commandment of god it was just the commandment of god you shall not eat that particular tree but any tree so it's a yeah. clever way of saving yeah. and, and and here's so let, let me bring this out so Cory I'm, I'm, I'm with, I'm, that is, that is excellent. Um, and, and for sure that's, that's part of this. I do want us to see that when we come to the climax of revelation in the new Testament, we, we, we recognize and see that any changing of God's word is, is, is a sin. And so, and so in revelation 22, anyone who adds to the book of the prophecy will be destroyed. The curses will be added. Anyone who takes away their book of their 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 name in the book of life will be taken away and so 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 for sure entrapment entrapment is is probably the most clearest example of of the serpent sin but behind those sins so looking also at at we talked about what's in the heart um pride um um corruption this so satan does not trust god's word he he doubts so there's all these other things that we're going to see later so so um, yeah, I, I think I think it's all of the above, but I, I I definitely agree in the context if we're focusing. I I really like what 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 um, Bull Boy said. This entrapment, really good, R really good observation. Excellent, excellent. Yeah. So Tim, can I can I add uh, a little? Bit? Yeah, we yeah. have also to understand that uh, at the very beginning of that chapter, the serpent was described explicitly as crafty, and. Yeah. You know the Hebrew word in renditions of that word crafty is actually deceiver. So, yes. Uh, yeah. Rule, rule, rule of hermeneutics <laughs> the context and how the how the narrator describes the the serpent or the person or the actor or whatever. Yeah. yeah. And, and and deceit is also a sin. So deceit and maybe that's the biblical word of reference to entrapment. Would it, would deceit and entrapment be the same, Koyo Boboy, or would that be a different nuance? Or could we say it's synonymous? Uh, that's, that's different. Deceit is the element of the crime. Entrapment is the is the uh, part of the action. Let's think about that. Let's because deceit is deceit is also is also part of that. And there's also lying. So there's there's so many different. What there's so many other sins. There are so many the other English, sins. Yeah. The, um, and team, the the English the English word of deceit used in law comes from the word. I don't know if it's Latin or whatever is malice. Malice. Okay. Comes, malice. Okay. It's come from word malice. Okay. So there must be malice in order for the crime to be to be considered as a crime. Okay. If there is okay. no malice, in some it is understood as deceit. But okay. the, the modern law uses the word malice. Okay, Siggy, Siggy. Okay. Yeah. Great. So 
regard great question jesus great answers from everyone across the board and so i think we can see that there was just a smorgasbord of sin going on but the focus is on man and woman not as much the serpent because redemption will not be given to him <laughs> so, so so that's exactly. why so, yeah exactly yeah. So because yeah. we much focus more in the man and woman, so we forget the, what the serpent has yeah. done. Yeah, but it's it's very important. It's a great question, and, and it's really important. And Voss is highlighting that. So so so, so great. Um, let's move on here because I do want to finish. I do want to finish this. We're going to finish this by God's grace tonight. So um, uh, number three, the continuity of the work of deliverance is declared and ex declared and extends to the seed of the woman and the serpent, both the power and the kingdom of darkness and part of the human race are on the side of the serpent. So we don't have time to go to go here. Um, now, Voss highlights, he talks about the power and the kingdom of, of, of darkness, but, but it must also include part of the human race. And the reason, the reason why we know this is because oftentimes uh, evildoers, wicked people are referred to as children of snakes <laughs> that's an allusion back to the garden so in matthew 3 7 john the baptist warns the pharisees he says you children of vipers literally offspring of snakes who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come and so um you have these references even throughout the prophets uh, references to, to to wicked people in israel outside as being offspring of serpents and that's a reference back to the offspring of satan not literally they can't literally be the offspring but figuratively and oftentimes in scripture um you can be called sons of light you can be called sons of darkness you can be called sons of belial uh which is like foolish wicked people so it's not a literal progeneration but it's like in characteristic okay like in characteristic and so this is also to be included in this idea of 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 the of the, of the seed although we want to accent it is all it is focused upon this one character satan the dragon the devil okay is that is everyone tracking uh uh with me there the other passage of scripture that we can go to is um is uh john 8 39 to 47 we don't have time to open up there let me just read it to you john 8 john chapter 8 verses 39 to 47 says they answered him abraham is our father jesus said to them if you were abraham's children you would be doing the works that abraham did most important being belief and faith but now you seek to kill me a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. This is not what Abraham did. You are doing the works your father did. They said to him, we were not born in sexual immorality. We have one father, even God. So they're saying, no, our father's God. And Jesus said to them, if you were, if God was your father, you would love me for I came from God and I am here. I came not of my own accord. Uh, why do you not understand what I say? It is because you cannot bear to hear my word. You are of your father, the devil, <laughs> and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and, he, and did not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. He, when he lies, he speaks out of his own character. He is a liar and the father of lies. So, so many references back to garden here in Jesus' teaching. Um, and, and the big takeaway here is that is that Satan is the king, he's the granddaddy, but also um, those who are wicked people that refuse to submit to the kingdom of God, refuse to obey and trust in his uh, servant, Jesus, they are also to be included here. So it, it's a both and. Um, number four, the issue of enmity is foretold. The OT revelation approaches the concept of a personal Messiah very gradually, um, and then I added here first in Abraham's offspring, then in the Messiah. So, so over time, God has chosen to successively reveal and to clarify. So don't, so, so think about 
if we let me try to draw this here. Um, what's going on here, if we can, if we can imagine, is this. If I can draw this here, what we let me just so we think of this as this is the this is the the promise offspring, right? This has this has an idea conveyed in Genesis 3. It's not very big, okay? So then what I want us to do is I want us to look at this in time, okay? In time, what's going to happen is God is going to slowly reveal until you have the full the full uh, um, revelation of the Messiah in Christ. So we don't know yet. This is just very small. We don't have all the understanding. Okay. By the time we come here, we find out this is um, this is the word. This is the king. This is the, the prophet, the priest, son of God, son of man. So what's happening, what I'm trying to get at here is that in time, God is slowly revealing to us. So then here, Maybe we find out, okay, this is going to be the son of Abraham. And then we get to hear, okay, this is going to be the son of David. So is everyone tracking with me that this is the, this is the first promised, so we call this the proto-evangelium. And then over time in Revelation, God's going to reveal it until we have the climax. So the other image is, if you can imagine here, it's the seed. The seed's just there. And then over time, over time, it grows. It's growing, it's growing. Then you have some leaves here. You have some leaves here. Until finally in the New Testament, you have the full understanding of the, um, the Messiah. So is, is everyone tracking there with me? with how this works. So this is why Voss is belaboring the point that, that it's going to be revealed uh, very slowly, very gradually, okay? But it begins in the curse of the serpent. It goes back to the curse of the serpent. That is the first promise. That's why redemption begins in the garden, special revelation, of redemptive history begins in the garden. It starts here in fundamental seed form, okay? Next, we have this idea of the seed of the woman. So um, the seed can be collective and individual, okay? I'm gonna show you how it's both collective and individual in the New Testament, okay? So, so fundamentally, it's the answer to the question is who is the seed? Jesus Christ, fundamentally, okay? But because we are in union with Jesus, we can also be included. And, and that makes better sense with, with the offspring being from the woman. So we're gonna see, we're gonna see this, okay? The promise is somehow out of the human race, a, a fatal blow will be done to the serpent, okay? At the climax of the struggle, the serpent seed will be represented. Uh, the serpent seed will be represented by the serpent in the same manner the woman's seed will find representation in a single person. So, it, fundamentally, it's it's one to one. The dragon verse, the dragon verse, uh, Jesus. Okay, but but the offsprings are also included. It's so it's not an either or. It should be a both and. And then this is initial and preparatory. We need so this is repeating what I said before. We need to wait to see how scripture will reveal and unfold the promise. So Genesis 3 does not reinterpret the New Testament. The New, Inter the New Testament clarifies Genesis 3. Is everyone tracking there with me? That is a fundamental understanding of relationship and of 
uh, framework. And so here it is my perspective that the seed is both individual and corporate, um, individual in the Christ, but corporate in his people because of our union with Christ. So let me just go, I'm going to go to three passages and um, we'll be almost done. Okay, let's go to three passages here so you clearly see what I'm, I'm referring to. So let's go to Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2, and I'll just begin in verse, I'll begin in verse 8. So you can see how we're looking for death. We're looking for overcoming the powers of darkness, the kingdom of Satan, right? So we're looking for that. We're looking for overcoming the kingdom of Satan. Um, we're looking at when that happens. So we have this concept in our mind. Verse 8, see to it that no one takes you by ca captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental, elemental spirits of the world, not according to Christ. For in him the whole fullness of deity uh, dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. In him also you were circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, by the putting off of the body of the flesh, by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were raised with him through faith by, in the powerful working of God. So this is union with Christ. You are in union with him in close relationship. You are buried in baptism. You are raised through faith. Faith is that cohesion that brings us in the union. Um, you were dead in your trespasses and uncircumcision of faith. God made you alive together, forgiving us all our trespasses, canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. Watch. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them. So this would be a reference to the, the kingdom, the power of Satan, um, his domain. It's not, uh, it's not a strong, explicit as much as we would like, but it's, it's clearly there. It's clearly present. Disarming rulers and authorities would be spiritual rulers and authorities and putting them to open, open shame because they thought, they thought by killing Jesus, right? They thought by killing Jesus, they would triumph over him. But when he died on the cross, he took away their power in the law. Once he took away the power of the law by paying for that debt, th those Satan lost all his control over you, right? The strength of Satan, the strength that Satan has over all of us is our bondage to the law, okay? When that was taken, he's put, in it, he's put the open shame, okay? Let's look at an example now where Christ's body, Christ's body is also being understood. So let's go to Romans chapter 16, verse 20. 16, verse 20. If ever... If ever, so it's, 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 he will bruise your heel, you will bruise his head, he will bruise his head. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. <laughs> that is a reference. This is a reference. This is a reference to um, the crushing of Satan's head. So it's, it's not just, it's not just Christ, it's us, but it's, there's no, there's no pride for us because we're in union with Christ. And so remember Christ is the head. We are the body. We are the body of Christ. So we are doing this. So think about this, the, the, the image that makes this, this is not, this is not individual. This is not individual. Okay, this is true because Christ is the head and we are the body. So this is a reference to crushing the foot, the head of Satan. This is the corporate church. Is everyone tracking there with me? So this is not, it's not like you or I are a Messiah. <laughs> okay, we're not, we're not, we're not the Messiah. Okay, it's in the sense, is everyone tracking? Let me take a minute, ask a question. I hope everyone understands what's going on here. 
Paul's statement is not to, to let anyone boast saying this is your doing. It's that we as the body of Christ, as his feet, as a body are trampling over the head of Satan. Is everyone tracking there with me? This is not, this is not an individualistic reading, okay? Let me just take a moment. I want to make sure everyone is understanding me. If you read it in an individualistic Western context, we, you can have a big head, or you could actually think that you can overcome Satan. <laughs> no. And where, where do we see, where do we see Christ's body triumphing over the powers of darkness and Jesus is teaching? Where is it? Famous passage. The kingdom of Satan being destroyed. Matthew 16, right? The gates of hell, the gates of hell will not triumph. Let's go to Matthew 16. Let's go to Matthew 16. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. I tell you, you are Peter. On this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Who is the aggressor here? <laughs> Who is the aggressor? The aggressor is not the gates. It's not hell, right? The church is conquering the gates of hell. It's overcoming. Do you see that? So powerful. Everyone tracking there with me? I will build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The church is, is on the attack of the powers of darkness. We are going forward, right? We are binding Satan. We are casting out Satan in the name of the Holy Spirit. Everyone tracking there with me? So, so if we have an individualistic reading of this, we can, we can actually claim to be Messiah. Follow, follow <laughs> keep a lawyer, right? Keep a lawyer. I am, I am the new son of God, right? But if we, have a, if we have a robust theological framework that we are in union with Christ, we are his body, he is, he is the head, then we can speak about his body crushing the head of Satan, destroying the powers, uh, the kingdom of hell, not, not because of us, but because of the work of the spirit, the presence of the spirit. And, and the head of Christ, okay? Let's go to one more passage of scripture that we can see this clearly. I hope this is making sense to you. Revelation, Revelation. Revelation chapter 12, verses 10. Yeah, let me begin in verse seven. Now war arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon. The dragon and his angels fought back. He was defeated. There was no longer any place for him in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, the ancient serpent, who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to earth and his angels were thrown down with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of God and the authority of Christ, his Christ has come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before God. Watch, they have conquered him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. So look at who's conquering Satan. This is going back to the garden. Who is conquering Satan? It's the saints, but it's through the blood of Jesus. And that, co that comes back to what we looked at in Colossians 2, that on the cross, Satan was conquered. They conquered him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. Again, this is a corporate of course, it includes the individual, but this is not for our pride. This is not for our boasting. This is, this is the undoing of the curse, okay? I hope, I hope you can see that big picture. I hope you can see that big picture there. So when we talk about the seed, we want to say, say the complete focus, the exaltation is on Jesus, but there is a component in which because we are in union with him, we are his body, we are his church. We also crush the head of Satan. And that is actually biblical. It's scriptural. It's biblical theological. It's exegetical. Let's, let's finish the slide here, and then we'll, we will go ahead and um, um, close it out here. Okay, so we're, we're going to get this done here. Um, lastly, human suffering. So then this is the last component that he talked about. 
uh, there is a punishment for, for the, the woman. The woman is condemned to suffer in what constitutes her nature as woman. So she is to suffer in childbirth. Um, man is given painful labor in the ground that will eventually lead to his death. So, so it's not the labor part, it's the painful part, okay? Um, but the grace, and this is what people really brought out, and this is so amazing, the human race will continue and grow through childbirth. So women, the woman will give life. It's a type for, 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 for a picture. And there's grace. Man will be able to produce life-sustaining food. And so these are, again, physical pictures of, of spiritual truths. But it's, it's in this context. It's, we don't run off saying all these other allegorical stuff. It's, 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 very, it's very specific very specific. Um, this is, this is Voss's, we'll close on this quote. The, as the woman is, uh, is enabled to bring new life into the world, so man will be enabled to support life by his toil. So there's, look at this now, everyone, look at this. There is, there is both in this judgment, there's physical death. There's also a warning of spiritual death Biba, but there's also the promise of redemption and there's also common grace in the giving and allowing life to live and in allowing life to be sustained there is it it is the grace of god is so incredible he is such a merciful god and what we're going to see later is that man really takes advantage Cain takes advantage, Lamech takes advantage, and, and the human race really takes advantage of, of God's grace. But there's even more grace because God is an all-wise God, slow to anger, um, and abounding in steadfast love to thousands. <laughs> so, so, so great passage quoted that one time. So with that being said, it is now 9-10. Um, I'm going to break you back up into groups. You can discuss. I want you to, if you want to, if you want to discuss, if you have more questions, you can ask your questions. Maybe you can answer questions in the groups. If you just want to, to, to close in prayer and be done, that's completely fine. Um, I'll leave it to you. And um, if you have more questions, write them down and we'll have a discussion this coming Sunday night. We will be looking at Ezekiel 28 because it is fundamental to understanding Satan um, uh, uh, and Satan's work, although some of it's in the back. We'll, we'll talk through all those different issues, okay? So I, I, do, I do want us to, 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 to be confident on Ezekiel 28 and the significance it has and also who Satan is. So we'll look at some other passages as well. Um, um, and, and just because of... of of our context here. So with that, um, may you go in peace. May the love of God be with you. May the, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, and I'm, I'm sorry, may God's grace be with you. May, may Christ's love be with you. And may the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be, be with you this week. So I'll, I'll dismiss you now to your breakout rooms.